webinar two, and welcome to this ACT webinar on achieving operational efficiencies in bank relationship maintenance. Uh, I'm James Lockyer, Development Director here at the ACT, and just before we get started, uh, I'll remind you of the ACT webinar setup and explain some technical points. There's a menu bar across the bottom that allows you to open various windows, and you can move these around your screen, resize them, or minimize them. The green button with a question mark on it down there is for help if you have any technical difficulties, and another button opens the Q&A window. You can send in questions by typing in the Q&A window. Please um, don't wait until the end to send in your questions. Just send them in as they occur to you, and we'll deal with them as soon as appropriate or at the end of the presentations. And our practice is that we don't disclose any names. I should add that a recording of this webinar will be available on the ACT website in a couple of days' time, along with a separate copy of all the slides. We're delighted to have Anna Pazzoni from Thomson Reuters and James Kelly from Rentikel Initial with us today. Um, both have wide experience in this area and have clearly put a lot of thought into how corporates and banks can manage their relationships more effectively, particularly in today's compliance-heavy world. And they're very much looking forward to sharing their experiences today. And Thomson Reuters have sponsored today's webinar, so on behalf of us all, can I thank them for that support. The specific issue we're going to discuss is bank account maintenance and KYC. But this leads into a range of other issues such as what do corporates want from their banks, what does each see as value in the relationship, and how does such a relationship generate growth. And so that's what we'll be hearing about today <coughs> from James and from Anna. They will each run through a short presentation, and we will have plenty of time for Q&A, so please do ask away. So let's get started um, with James. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm James Kelly. I, I look after the Treasury function at Rentakill Initial. Um, we operate in over 65 countries now, um, and our experience of KYC in particular varies. Um, the international banks clearly are tightening up their KYC activities, um, largely in response to various fines and increasing regulation. And, and so we've seen that the landscape change a lot over the last few years. If I think back to just a few years ago, KYC checks were, were undertaken, but were relatively basic um, and were performed with new clients. Uh, the requests were reasonably predictable. It would be um, list of shareholders, company structures, um, a number of basics that were were fairly universal across banks. Uh, and once KYC was undertaken for an entity, typically adding additional services, so adding an extra bank account, uh, adding FX lines, didn't require additional KYC. What we've now found is that the KYC checks are so extensive that often additional checks are required for additional services. And so what you now find is that if you, if you go to open an extra bank account or go to set up FX lines, that the KYC process becomes a core part of the account opening process or the, the process for adding lines or the process for, for taking debt. Um, and as a treasurer, that's a total nightmare. Um, the, the last thing you want is a fairly ad hoc, difficult to predict um, process which can take a varying length of time. Um, we still have the basic KYC checks performed with new clients, or check company numbers, that side of thing, but the, the list of requests is ever increasing. It varies from bank to bank and by geography. And as I've said, it's now a core part of adding any new service. And, and really, you know, as a customer, it's quite 
quite difficult to deal with. As an example, um, we recently set up in a in a new new territory, and, and below is is just a, a list of a, a few of the documents that were requested: um, a group structure, passports for signatories, names, addresses, and dates of birth of directors, utility bills, bank statements for authorized signatories, the U.S. tax status form, the W-8N copy of the annual report or report and accounts, certified articles of association, certified articles of incorporation, confirmation of the EMEA status, confirmation of exemption from Dodd-Frank, copy of the bank mandate, certified copy of specimen signatures and board authorizations. That was for opening a single account um, and, and collating that data was, was nigh on a day's work. KYC requests really slow execution. Um, the ad hoc nature means that it's difficult to prepare everything in advance. Um, and guaranteeing delivery of the documents can be challenging. Um, we've all had experiences of sending documents to our contact at a relationship bank only to find that although it's been signed for by the postman, it never arrives at their desk or you know, six hours later they're still trying to find out what's happened to it. Similarly, sending documents by email isn't secure and can be intercepted. And certainly we've had instances where we've asked signatories for passports, utility bills, dates of birth, and they've been quite concerned about how they're going to be sent, what we're going to do with the data. Um, and I think you know, we owe a, 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 duty of a duty of care to our, uh, to our signatories and anyone that we're, we're sending data on behalf of. Um, you can go down the route of sending secure PDFs and a, a, a password separately, but my view has always been that if someone can intercept the first email, they can certainly intercept the second email with the password. The good news is that there is innovation that, that's coming to help us. Um, new KYC platforms are, are being produced which allow documentation to be stored online, which we can share with partner banks. The benefits are that the banks can then self-serve, meaning that rather than having a list of 15 documents, hopefully it's just the two that are unique to the bank that, that they're then requesting. They can check the portal, and they only require a confirmation that the information is up to date. The information can be shared across multiple banks rather than having to send packs to each bank. And the information is securely stored and delivery is guaranteed. The second piece um, that I should probably mention at the same time is around, for example, the bank account management process. And there are there are um, uh, this software eBAM that, that's available that, that helps with the process of filing account opening documentation, etc. Um, and that can be done via Swift, either through a TMS or through the Swift network. The KYC platforms are slightly different because they're they're dealing with documents that really can't be sent as a Swift message. There's no way of securely sending a, a scan of a passport via SWIFT um, to date. So why aren't we hearing more about these products from banks? Well, part of the, the piece is that banks view KYC as a compliance problem for them. They're not viewing it from our perspective as customers. Even some of the providers still see this as a financial services product forgetting who's providing the information in the first place. And without corporates, the product's going to have very limited potential. It'll be banks providing KYC on other financial institutions. As corporates, we, we provide the sort of real economy side of things. Where have we got to? Um, a number of our banks have adopted a, a seller which is the Thomson Reuters product that we've, we've started to use. 
Um, we found it really helpful. We've been able to store you know, our group structure, a lot of the basics around um, signatory information, uh, um, shareholder um, distributions, share registers, uh, articles of association, memorandum of art, um, W8N forms, a lot of the, the kind of basics that a lot of banks ask for. Some banks are still deciding which system they want to adopt. This is a slightly odd piece from, from my perspective because the banks are viewing it as we will choose which KYC platform we want to use and then we'll ask our customers to use that same one. Now, you know, we, we face nine banks uh, internationally and, and the number of local banks is, is probably a hundred more. If each let's say between them they ended up with, with 10 different providers. You know, the benefits that we get as a corporate from being able to share information are dramatically reduced because we're, we're having to remember 10 logons, provide the information 10 times. So we really need to push the banks to adopt a number of different systems because the choice of supplier should really sit with us, not with the bank or the customers. Uh, not with the bank, because we as customers otherwise will have to use different systems for different banks. So how do we lobby? The first one is speak to your relationship manager. Make sure that they're aware that this is a product that can help you as a customer. Many of them are viewing it from the perspective of, you know, they've, they've offshored their KYC requirements. There's a compliance department somewhere who've got responsibility for for doing that. Sometimes it's in India, sometimes it's a, you know, a different office. But effectively they view that as this is an opportunity for us to, to lose some of that overhead. And that's lovely for them, but it's not very customer orientated. It, it's, it's quite orientated to where the, where the banks are. How do we make sure that things are relevant? Well, we need to make sure that the providers, the, the potential suppliers of, of this KYC KYC products actually really understand the issues from a corporate perspective. Um, again, as I said, one or two are viewing it very much as a financial institution product uh, and forgetting a little bit what the unique side um, that a, a corporate faces. Um, the ACT surveys show that KYC worries treasurers. Um, this is something that we should be we should be drawing attention to rather than accepting. You know, we need to make clear we've seen a worsening of, of, of the customer experience. You know, I, I think back to the days where I could open an account in 24 hours and, and now I'm told that you know, that's never going to be possible again because of KYC. Well, if we can start to at least tame the KYC process, then we might start to see a bit of a, an improvement in service again. I'm going to open things up to any questions at this stage. Yeah, I've got uh, one question that's come in. Um, inquiring whether you find that KYC requirements vary uh, depending on where accounts are opened on the location uh, of the service being provided. That's, that's definitely the case. Di different banks have different requirements. Even um, within the same territory? Even within the same territory, right. yes. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to use a quote from, from Bank of America that I saw er earlier on, that banks view KYC as a core part of their risk management process, and therefore it's important for them to have different models. That doesn't help us at all. What it does mean is that there is a certain level of standardization. There are certain things that effectively all banks are required to, to request as a result of the regulation, and then some go beyond that. We can at least cover off the, the core piece, and then it becomes more obvious which banks are the outliers requiring more information. And, and just as we look at you know, the, the, level of, uh, the, the level of service that we get when it comes to products, 
I think it is a relevant piece to look at you know, how onerous are the requirements for opening accounts. Yeah. Um, you know, there are banks who I wouldn't enter into certain transactions with because I know that I just wouldn't get them done. Um, it's all you know, I, I can think of examples of banks who come forward and say, well, look, you know, we would be there for you in the event of an acquisition. You know, we've got a balance sheet to burn. And then you think about every interaction you've had with them, and it's taken forever. And they've, you know, as soon as the lawyers get on the case, it just becomes a nightmare. And so I think you know, this allows us to start getting beyond the completely custom, almost having to have completely custom processes for every time, uh, and really get down to, well, this is the standard information I'm going to provide. That was fine for Bank X, and if you as Bank Y want additional information, that's fine, but I'll remember that, and next time it comes to a tender, you're going to have to justify why I should go with you, because it's going to be a little bit harder for you. Yeah. And add, add interest, that's a, that's a really interesting point. On, on your tender process now, yeah. does, is KYC one of the, effectively the service items that forms part of that tendering process? Um, it can be. I mean, it, in much the same way as as when you when you issue a bond or you you bank do a bank deal, you'll have conditions precedent. We'll ask for effectively what are the conditions precedent for opening an account, for making payments, etc. Otherwise, you, you get halfway down the line and it's a nasty surprise because everyone wants to, to tell you about the the nice glossy functionality, but actually, if if the challenge is that is going to take forever and a day to get to the nice glossy functionality, and, and by that stage, all enthusiasm has been lost. Um, then, yeah. then really, that that experience isn't a great one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think there's one other question before we move <coughs> on, Anna, to your section. And also, I think there's a question that's been asked, which which I think you can help cover. In a couple of questions, actually, which I think you can help cover as you go through yours. But just just one uh, for you, James. I, I may have slightly misinterpreted this one. Um, there's a question in saying you mentioned nine different K KYC models, and are banks giving you access to these? Which I think is a reflection on are banks um, transparent with you as to what they want in the way of KYC? They're transparent as long as you ask the right questions. They won't necessarily volunteer it. So, some will, um, but generally speaking, It'll be a case of, you know, you get part, if you don't prompt them, you won't get a list of requirements until you're you've pretty much signed on the line. Yeah, yeah. But I, I guess in terms of the the overall philosophy, they're not very open about that. Yeah, yeah. So okay. you know, they they won't. Ex you, you, you'll get. A little bit of colour from a relationship manager who might say, "Well, look, you know, we're a US bank, therefore we have to be ultra careful, or we're HSBC, and you know, we don't have a great record on this." Um, apologies to anyone from HSBC on the line, um, but but generally speaking, there's there's not a, a sort of there's not too much colour in terms of you know this is where our strategy is, yeah. this is where we see the market. Yeah. So at the moment, actually thinking about it, I know we've discussed this sort of outside the call, but, but, but I think the interesting thing is that banks could have an opportunity to actually have a slick, efficient KYC process as part of their offering. Yeah. Um, if not as part of the value add, at least as part of sort of efficiency add. Uh, and there, there are some banks. I mean, we, we, we've recently made a, a UK acquisition, and I've been very, very impressed with one of the UK banks and, and, and their process, which you know, really they've, they've used companies' house as much as they possible, possibly can. They, they've used the information that they already have. And while they've come back to us with, with one or two queries, they've generally tried to make that run as quickly as possible and they've been very open up front as to what they need. So I, so I think it, it is one of those things that there is an opportunity to differentiate. The difficulty to a certain extent is you don't 
understand that differentiation until you've been through the process. Yeah, by which time it's a little bit too late. Yeah. Um, I think moving, Anna, move, moving on to um, your session, I, and I think um, there's a couple of points here. There's one about, uh, I sort of predicted <coughs> one about um, what is the cost of, say, the Acellus um, offering. Uh, and I think there's another one um, saying, well, if you're going to um, basically use a third-party repository for a bunch of information, how, um, how is that uh, kept secure? Uh, and, you know, uh, and this particular question says, well, can't you just simply use Companies House for this? So I think a little bit, you know, around sort of the competitive environment as well, Anna. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, James. And, um, <clears throat> And thank you, ACT, for inviting us to participate um, and host uh, this webinar. So, <clears throat> you know, as a former banker, I can understand some of the, the challenges the banks are facing. But I can also see that what we're trying to do here is we're trying to help improve the client experience for their customers and essentially, at the end of the day, really accelerate the ability to do business. Because that's what's happening right now, is that this regulation is slowing down the ability for firms like Rent-A-Kill to be able to open accounts and conduct business, whether it's here in the UK or you know, in, firm, in um, countries in Latin America, Asia, et cetera. And <clears throat> we think that there is a very straightforward approach to solving this problem. So if we go to... Um, the next slide, I'll just kind of talk you through how we see this. So obviously, you know, everybody understands that the bank challenges are really around the enforcement of regulation. The cost of doing this is rising. Um, they've got, obviously, expensive IT costs in supporting this, and they've got reputational um, risk issues associated with not getting it right around implementing the, regula um, the regulation. So what is the big driver here? Well, it is the, the basically the five big regs right there in the middle. So you've got your money laundering and terrorist financing regs. You've got FATCA, which is the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, <coughs> uh, which went into effect in July of 2014. That's the U.S. regs, um, tax regs, which are now expanding. And I think this is really where, where the big problem is going to start to come. But these regs are starting to expand and will go um, to over 40 other countries and start to go into effect in 2017. It's going to be around tax reporting and exchanging of documents. Then you've got the obvious EMIR, the European regs there that are the equivalent to Dodd-Frank, and then you've got the MIFID um, reporting regs. So as you can imagine, the banks are trying to understand all these regs. They're trying to understand all the data that's required to uh, for them to obtain from their clients um, in order to ensure that they've done the due diligence required. There's a couple challenges for them, though. First of all, implementing regs is basically just the cost of doing business. This does not give them a competitive advantage. Everybody that's in banking should be implementing these regs and carrying them out in a proper manner. You know, what banks are about is obviously financing um, and providing uh, you know, the necessary lines of credit to expand business. So this is what a group of banks have said to us, the Thomson Reuters, and why they wanted us to build a you know, managed service for the industry is because it doesn't give them a competitive advantage to do this really well, number one. Number two, the regs are changing, and they will constantly change. And so the cost of trying to keep up with that is one bank is very onerous. So why not come together as a group of banks and try to manage that on <clears throat> that so that their clients have a better experience. So, you know, James actually talked about a number of the issues that you see on the left-hand side of the screen there, really, the amount of time. But time is an, is an interesting one because, you know, in terms of um, duplicating processes, as James said, you know, he could be just, um, distributing those 13 documents that you saw on the slide earlier to um, 10 financial institutions. Right? And each of those financial institutions might be reviewing rent to kill at different points in time. Right? And so thus he's having to you know, keep those documents continuously updated and shared with his, um, with his bank. Then you've got the challenge which he highlighted, which is lack of control, data control, and access, and the information security challenges. 
but also one of the biggest issues you have is data privacy. And this is one of the challenges for the banks. Because the banks have so many different legal entity structures, right, they can't necessarily share documentation from Rent-A-Kill across those legal entity structures. It depends on what kind of agreements they have in place. So you've got to make sure that you have the data privacy authorization to be able to do that. And when you have a, um, a managed service provider sitting in the middle, they can obtain those kind of authorizations on behalf of rent to kill and share those kind of documents across complex um, financial institutions. But the, the other point was the lack of common standards, which as Jane said, you know, it's difficult to predict because these requests can be very ad hoc depends on the compliance officer in that particular bank and how they see rent to kill and you know how they're how familiar they are with their business. But I can tell you that when we did our due diligence um, on building out this service, and I've been working on this since the end of 2012, we have met with the regulators in the UK twice. We've met with the US regulators twice, the Canadians, the, um, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, South Africa, France. Um, all of these regulators we've met with multiple times to educate them about the business problem. And one of the things that's very clear when meeting with them is they have all said they want to see a standard. They, and they think, and we believe this as well, that it is possible to create a standard across jurisdictions. And we've done that. You know, we actually have a standard that goes across the 11 major capital markets. And so it's, the regulators want to see standards because it makes enforcement easier for them, number one. number one. But number two, the real thing that the, the regulators want to see the banks focusing on is not collecting documents. What they want them to do is spend more time understanding who they're banking. And that's where we get to the next point, which is the, you know, the complexity around legal entity structures and how can financial, I mean, how can corporate um, asset managers be able to keep their banks up to date on those changing legal entity structures. So that's just a, a few of the problems that we see in the um, current situation for the corporate treasury market. And then if we go to the, <clears throat> the next slide, what you'll see here is that in our process of doing our research on the business problem, we actually hired um, a global research firm who conducted um, research with many of the major uh, financial institutions in 2013. And at that time, and we're talking what, at least a year and a half ago, um, that the clients were waiting as long as 34 weeks before they could be onboarded right, with a financial institution. Well, at the end of the day, that's not good for the financial institution. It's certainly not good for their client. Right? You know, the obvious things of lost revenue in terms of customer attrition. You know, they've got duplicate, re um, they've got duplicate resources. Um, focused on this, trying to collect the necessary documents that we already talked about. And then, of course, the corporate treasurer's time spent on KYC, which is, you know, for them, you know, that could be time better well spent um, <clears throat> in terms of looking at their other um, ex financial exposures that they need to hedge for the firm. I think, as I talked about earlier, you know, the whole, the issues around tax compliance is going to become bigger. And I, you, uh, you need to be aware that that the OECD has worked with over 40 jurisdictions to agree common reporting standards. They're going to start to come in effect in 2017. And so that's going to create you know, an information exchanging um, requirement so that uh, there can be more information you know, being exchanged around who is actually being banked with, the, uh, with these particular corporations. So if I go to, um, if I go to the, the next slide, I think. When you, James, you actually highlighted that there was a question around the cost. Well, the cost, in the way we've actually built the service and working with a group of banks, the cost is really, um, is really incurred by the banks themselves because they're the ones that have the regulatory obligation to do the due diligence. Corporates do not pay um, to use the service. But, you know, and it's their data at the end of the day. Um, that's kind of the way Thomson Reuters looks at that. So essentially what we've done is we've provided, um, we've provided a, a central utility. Uh, everything is stored in our Docklands data center here in London. So we're subject to the European data privacy laws, which when I met with the regulators in Singapore and Hong Kong and Australia, for example, they were all very, very comfortable with us basing the data 
out of Europe because Europe has the strongest data privacy laws in the world. And that's extremely important when you're talking about um, you know, holding this kind of information. So we, we make this service available complementary to the, to the firms, but it's essentially, at the end of the day, you know, a very quick, efficient way for uh, corporate treasurers to be able to manage their information that they share on a repeatable basis um, with their financial institutions. Um, you know, in terms of the information security requirements, in terms of storing this data, um, yes, you do have, there is a big investment required in terms of the information security. Um, we, we store this data, as I mentioned, in our Docklands Data Center, which runs the world's largest foreign exchange trading platform. Um, trades about four trillion a month across that platform. So, you know, we are very comfortable with the, um, with the, uh, the investment we've made there around information security. We're obviously ISO certified, and I'm pleased to say that we just received our certification from PwC for our ISAE 3000 audit around our managed service. So that's um, that was another big point around giving clients not only corporate such as Renick Hill, but also the banks in particular, the comfort to know that how the service is being managed. So I'll stop right there because I'm sure there's probably a few questions. Yeah, one or two. Um, a, a detailed point which I think is, is, is very relevant. Um, as we were discussing earlier, some, some banks insist on things being there in original. How is that covered off using you know, a, a third party service? So I can, I can say that um, the banks that we're working with are very comfortable with electronic documents. Um, what we do in the portal is we actually embed an electronic signature so that a client has to certify that the documents they've provided are true and correct, and that they, when they load those documents up, um, the information that's downloaded by the bank includes that e-signature with that certification. Right. So, so <laughs> for, the, for the classic, um, you know, sort of document that has to be sort of notarized as a true copy and original, can that be accommodated in the in the system as well? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You can you can load those types of documents in. Yeah. Sort of. And how are the banks, I suppose, buying into this? What's the reaction amongst the banks? The banks are very excited about this, right? They are excited in the sense that um, they think it's going to improve the quality of the information that they have on their, um, on their clients because it's an easy way for the clients to keep the information updated, right? So, for example, when rent kill you know, needs to essentially swap out a board member, right, and they need to put a name of a new board member, that information immediately is updated to all the banks on the same site. Okay, right? so is it, and is it pushed line. out of your portal? Oh, yes, it's pushed oh, okay. out. Right. It's pushed out to the banks. That rent to kill for example, is authorized to receive that mm -hmm. data. It doesn't go just out into the general public. Sure. The firm has to authorize the receipt of the data. Right, right, okay. Uh, and we've had another query, it, uh, sort of it goes kind of back to the consistency point, is how the service uh, manages to meet the requirements of a variety of different regulatory jurisdictions. Um, you know, you, you mentioned 11 different regulators who you've spoken to and are, you know, who are interested in the product and, and mm -hmm. presumably it meets their requirements. Um, is it simply a very clever product that you are, you know, the, the, the companies uh, and I suppose what guidance is there for companies as to what they load up to the portal? So that's a very interesting question. So the way that we've approached this, James, is we look, we consider this kind of the concept of a passport and a visa. Okay. As James referenced earlier, KYC due diligence is a, is a part of the risk management process within a financial institution. They need to understand who is you know, behind the particular legal entity. So that, <clears throat> that due diligence process um, is potentially going to vary from bank to bank in that they might need different types of documentation. However, there's a core basic amount of documentation that continuously has to be provided to, uh, to determine the identity of a legal entity, right? 
And so the way we look at this is it's like issuing a passport to rent a kill, right? And then when rent a kill wants to go from bank to bank, they you know send their passport over. Here's my passport, and here's all the associated documentation to validate my passport. Occasionally, a financial institution might require a visa in the passport, which means that they want some additional documentation because I'm traveling into another area, for example. And so we accommodate that through our systems and our operations team by um, reaching out to rent a kill on behalf of the bank to obtain that documentation. rent a kill would then load that documentation into the portal, and they leave it there, and then they authorize that particular bank to pick it up. Um, that's a way for them also to have an audit trail around the documents that they've provided to those particular financial institutions. So yeah, so you will sometimes find that certain banks m might have a different um, risk profile on a legal entity versus other banks, and that's the way you have, that's the way we manage it. Is that sure. passport yeah. visa concept. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one for you, James. Thinking about it overall, uh, what sort of reaction are you getting to this concept from your from your banking group? Um, I think it varies. I, I think for for a number of them. So some of our relationship managers are really engaged in the KYC process. So I can think of a couple in particular who said, oh, I spend you know, half my life working on KYC. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to, to have something that will make my life easier. Great. Hurrah. Um, a number have sort of said, well, uh, gosh, okay, this is, this, is how, this is dealt with by a different department. And they speak to the different department, and the different departments say, "Ah, well, yes, we, we do the processing, but it's effectively our procurement and legal and compliance department who are thinking about whether we adopt this." And and at the end of it, they sort of come back and say, "Well, um, we're going to come away. We're going to think about this as an organisation, and I'll come back to you with an answer." So there are a couple who who are still waiting to give an answer because. There's, there's probably someone sitting in an office somewhere who's, who's rolling a magic eight ball uh, as we speak. Um, but effectively, I, I think that the reality is that the way that we address this is by raising awareness and saying, look, you know, you think the KYC is an issue for you? Well, it's also for us. You know, we don't particularly like having to send email packs off with, you know, just a, a, an example where we're updating one of our our signatories, in that process, I've got 48 documents being signed and sent out for special delivery, and, and we're not really sophisticated enough to have a mail merge with all the addresses, so um, one of my team is going to be sitting there and writing out, you know, addresses on envelopes, you know, sending them all off special delivery. Um, you know, that's not, not really a, a value-added point, um, so actually just b by being able to Click a switch and, get, uh, and pushing the data out. That's that's a nice time saver, um, and and really, it's it's a piece that I I want to push quite hard. Actually, that's a, that's another interesting point because you you stick 27 packets in special delivery and effectively you sort of cross your fingers and hope they get there in a way. Well, you, you, spend, you spend half half the next morning viewing. You know, I've I've got my recorded delivery number. I'm on the Royal Mail website. Have they signed yet? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yes, they've signed. It's reached it. the post room. Yes. <laughs> Hello, relationship manager. Have you received this? No, I have no yeah. idea what you're yeah. talking about. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, you know, not only is it half a day to prepare the, the packets, but it's half a day just to make sure they've actually all been arrived. Yeah. Whereas using the third, the third party product, we just pulled it slightly from the set but yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. Basically. Each bank subscribing to that has their nominated contact, presumably. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so as soon as you send it into Excellus, so Excellus just alerts the nominated contact. Mm -hmm. And and so effectively, you know, you've sent it to a seller, so you can you can basically prove you have sent it to um, you know, onto your onto your banking group. Uh, and kind of broadening broadening that to a kind of real world example. If you're selling a business or you make someone redundant or something along those lines, what you don't want to do if someone's being made redundant, let's say you get the tip off a couple of days before, you don't really want to preempt things and take them off until you've had the nod that this is definitely happening. But at the 
same time, what you don't want to do is, is you know, it's going to be two days afterwards because you missed the post on, on day one, and you know, that now goes at half past two in the afternoon or whatever, and, and you've got a day and a half where you know, your disgruntled employee is still a signatory um, and uh, free to rock up at a bank branch and do their worst. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, let's have a think. I think we've probably got how long we got left. Uh, I think we've probably got time for one more question. Yeah, there was one that came in. Um, it was about shareholder ID. Um, banks uh, asked me for a passport or ID of any shareholder with more than 10%. I work in a subsidiary. The company is private, <coughs> and it's almost impossible to have access to that information. So, in a way, partly, how reasonable is it? And if you're a private company or a public company, are the requirements or the ability to meet that any different? So this is going to be a common request from financial institutions, uh, in particular as the regulators are becoming more aggressive around enforcement of money laundering and terrorist financing regs. And essentially what the banks have to understand is who is that shareholder in terms of are they what they call a politically exposed person, a PEP? Are they associated with any type of sanctioned regime? Right? And I understand the challenges sometimes of getting board members' passports. But again, you know, this is where a, um, a solution, a managed service solution, could be a real benefit to a, to a board member. Because when you can actually store your documents in a secure environment, right, and that and thus, the treasurer is not continuously tracing down the board member for that data. And that the treasurer can also um, ensure who is getting access to that information on a need-to-know basis only. That gives everyone a lot of peace of mind. But I can, I can tell you that this is going to be a common request. If you don't have it today, you will be getting requests like this from your bank. Sure. Okay. Um, you know what? I think the time has come to wrap up. Um, I've got a blank piece of paper here saying key points. I think the key point probably is talk to your banks, find out that what they want, and um, ensure that they're aware of the increasing range of tools in the corporate space that's available to genuinely make everyone's life uh, more straightforward, uh, and certainly tools which have regulatory, effect, de facto regulatory approval have got to be worth looking at. Um, my thanks to our presenters and to Thompson Reuters for their sponsorship too. Thank you to, to everyone who joined today's session. I'm sorry if we didn't reach your question within our allotted time. I'm just going to ask a quick internal question here. Are we going to circulate a list of Q&As? We will be circulating uh, a consolidated list of Q&As afterwards, we hope. So that will be available as well as the slides. Um, we'll be putting up a recording um, in a couple of days' time, and we'll send you all a link to that. Um, looking forward to um, the rest of the year, um, we have um, uh, obviously the rest of our, our physical uh, conferences, including the ACT Europe conference on the 5th of March uh, in Dusseldorf, and we'd be delighted to see you there. And of course, the flagship, uh, flagship event for the ACT, um, the ACT Annual Conference in Manchester from the 20th to the 22nd of May. Um, thank you all very much for listening. Um, if you can spare a moment to provide some feedback on the webinar, we'd be very grateful. Just select the feedback widget in red from the bottom bar, uh, and the facility to do this will remain open for a short while after the webinar ends. From all of us here, thank you and goodbye.